All right, here we are at the Kingdom Fungi, and as you can tell, we've reverted to that old, the old style uh, presentations that I used to use that were fill in the blank. I just haven't had time to transform these into a, a, the more current system. Also note that we've we've already studied a lot of life on this planet. We've studied bacteria, in other words, all the prokaryotes, archaea, bacteria, uh, viruses, which are not considered alive, but we, we studied them anyway. And, uh, you know, that's really important to understand how viruses work because they infect us and make us sick, like COVID-19. Um, and we've also studied the kingdom protista. And so now we're going to study the uh, groups that came from or evolved from or have common ancestry with with different protists in other words the fungi the plants and animals and they represent three kingdoms so we're going to, we're going to study the kingdom fungi then the kingdom plantae and then the kingdom animalia and that's how we'll wrap up the course so one of the first things we're always going to do whenever we uh, start to study a, a new um, group of life is look at their general characteristics. In other words, what do all fungi have in common, for example? And the first thing you'll want to note is that they are eukaryotic, but they're not the only things to be eukaryotic that we've already studied. The whole kingdom protista is eukaryotic. Um, so fungi have common ancestry with the fungus-like protists that were eukary or are eukaryotic, and uh, fungi are eukaryotic as well. What makes them different is that they're multicellular, and most fungi are multicellular, and you might want to add, you know, a most to that when you write down multicellular. Most are multicellular because there are unicellular fungi, and those are the yeasts. But yeasts are the only unicellular fungi. All other fungi are considered multicellular. Also, what makes them different is they are absorptive heterotrophs. All of them are absorptive heterotrophs. Absorptive meaning that they digest the food on the outside of their cells in their body and they then absorb the nutrients. But they're eating others. That's what makes them heterotrophs. Um, but this differentiates them from, from animals because animals are ingestive heterotrophs. Animals take in food inside their body and digest it inside their body and absorb the nutrients. Like other organisms that we have studied and are going to study, uh, fungi have cell walls. But the cell walls of different groups of living things are made of different substances. So, for example, the cell walls of bacteria are, is made of peptidoglycan, and the cell walls of plants are made out of cellulose. But the cell walls of, of fungi is made out of chitin, which is the same carbohydrate uh, that makes up the exoskeleton of arthropods. So like insects, you know, the, the exoskeleton they have on the outside is also made of chitin, which possibly suggests some strange kind of common ancestry there. However, it would be very distant ancestry. Most fungi are saprophytes, which means that they live, they, they feed on dead and decaying organic material. So once living organisms are what saprophytes feed on um, and that's what fungi do. They feed on once living organisms, but some of them feed on living organisms. In other words, they, they just can't wait to start infecting something or, or growing on something. So they can't wait for something to die. So they start living on something that's alive. And that would be a parasitic fun fungus. Uh, for example, athlete's foot is a parasitic fungus uh, of the skin. And then there are other uh, fungi that are actually predators. There, there is a fungus that can actually kill and eat nematode worms, very, very tiny microscopic worms that live in the soil. They're able to capture them by lassoing them, basically, and then they, they kill them and eat them. So fungi have been around for a long time, and, and because of that, they're a very diverse group. And what we're looking at in this photo are morels. And so, as you know, fungi serve as a food source for us and, and other animals. And these are highly sought after by a lot of people. They go out morel hunting. Uh, they're hard to find, though. But what we eat of most fungi are uh, the things that you see here, which are actually fruiting bodies. They're referred to as fruiting bodies. They're reproductive structures uh, that, are, that, are, that grow up out of the soil. The fungus is living in the soil. Most of the fungus is living in the soil. And then it sends up these fruiting bodies in order to produce spores and reproduce. Um, and that's what we eat. So getting a little deeper into the characteristics, um, the general structure and function of fungi, as I mentioned on the previous slide, yeasts are the unicellular fungi, but the fungi that are multicellular 
are filamentous organisms. In other words, the, their cells are in chains of uh, forming filaments, long chains of cells forming filaments. And the name of the filaments in uh, fungi is hyphae. Hyphae is plural. Um, hypha would be singular. That's There it is right there, hypha. Each hypha is only one cell thick. And that's what we're seeing in the diagram here. And as it says here, in some fungi, not all, but some fungi, there are cross walls between cells in the filaments, in the hyphae. Uh, but you'll notice that there are holes in those septa. We call them septa, and the holes are known as septal pores. And what that does is it, it connects the cytoplasm between cells. And, uh, you know, along the whole filament, these cells are all connected to each other. And so the filament is basically... Uh, a passageway for nutrients to flow from one cell to the next, to the next, to the next. So uh, you can actually see, you can look under the microscope and see the flow of uh, the cytoplasm between cells in a filament of a fungus or a hyphae of a fungus. As you can see in the diagram of these hyphae that do have septa cross walls, um, there can be more than one nucleus in each cell. So it's, there's going to be either one or two nuclei in each cell because the, the septal pores are actually big enough for the nuclei to pass through. Uh, there are other hyphae, however, that have no septa. They have no cross walls at all. So the cytoplasm is continuous and the nuclei are just uh, continuous within that cytoplasm also. In other words, these hyphae are multinucleated. Those are known as soenocytic hyphae. So this is a vocabulary term that refers to hyphae that have no cross walls, have no septa, soenocytic. And what I'm trying to remind you of here is the common ancestry that uh, fungi have with the uh, fungus-like slime molds from the kingdom Protista. So this, is, uh, this characteristic of being multinucleated is similar to the acellular slime molds um, that form a big, that big, um, crawling multinucleated uh, conglomeration of cells known as a plasmodium. If you'll recall, the cells aggregate together and, and they form this big multinucleated blob that's referred to as a plasmodium that crawls along and feeds and eventually uh, puts up fruiting bodies and produces spores to reproduce. But in the case of fungi, the aggregated cells ha uh, form filaments instead of forming a big, a big blob. And that's because they have cell walls. So in these soenocytic fungi that, that, that don't have septa, they still have cell walls. So around the outside of the filament, around the outside of the hyphae, um, are cell walls supporting the hyphae. So for multicellular fungi, this is what's growing into whatever they are growing on. In other words, if we're talking about a piece of bread, um, the, the hyphae of the fungus, the bread mold, is growing into the bread, and, and as the hyphae grow through the bread, they secrete digestive enzymes outside of the cells. Those enzymes digest the bread, and then the nutrients are absorbed back into the cells of the hyphae, and then they travel throughout the entire uh, fungus through these highways that are created by the uh, basically the hollow filaments of the hyphae. That's how they feed, and that's what makes them absorptive heterotrophs. They're absorbing the nutrients. So as we, if we zoom out a little bit, and that's what we're looking at in this diagram, so here are all the hyphae that we were taking a closer look at so we could see the individual cells. But now we've zoomed out so you can see that the hyphae will form a big, what we call a big tangled mat known as a mycelium. So here, this is a, a toadstool that is growing in the soil, and all these hyphae down here are growing through the soil and feeding on the soil, the organic material that's in the soil, and absorbing the nutrients, and that's known as vegetative hyphae. It's also known as vegetative mycelium. So again, mycelium, the definition of mycelium is a tangled mat of hyphae. So you'll notice that we have a tangled mat of hyphae growing below the soil, and those hyphae are growing and feeding and absorbing nutrients, and so we refer to them as vegetative. And then there are hyphae that are above the ground that are also in a tangled mat, forming the fruiting body here that is producing spores. So that is made up of reproductive hyphae, specialized reproductive hyphae, 
And you can also refer to this as uh, reproductive mycelium because it's a tangled mat of hyphae. So the whole toadstool here is made up of uh, reproductive mycelium or reproductive hyphae that are specialized to produce spores. And if you've ever looked at the underside of one of these toadstools or mushrooms, you'll notice that there are gills. Uh, what look like gills. They look like fish gills. That's why we call them gills. But they're not for gas exchange like uh, like fish gills. They're uh, lined with spore producing structures known as sporangia. So there's another vocabulary term, sporangia being a spore producing structure. And this isn't the first time we've seen sporangia because we also encountered that, that term back when we were studying the kingdom protista including the fungus-like protists. And if you'll recall, we also came upon the term hyphae back then too, because the water molds uh, form hyphae. Remember, the, the fungus-like protists are not only slime molds, but also water molds. And the water molds have this, uh, share this characteristic with true fungi that they form hyphae, these filaments. And mycelia, the tangled mats of hyphae. If you'll recall back from, from when we were studying the kingdom protista, a lot of what makes different protists different from each other is in their life cycle. So their life cycle is a characteristic that we use to classify them, and it's no different in fungi. Um, and fungi have a life cycle that's very similar, as, as I'm noting all the way at the bottom right here, uh, very similar to a Chrysiomycota, which are the cellular slime molds, which are classified in the kingdom Protista. But these are the kind of organisms that fungi, true fungi that we're studying now, are thought to have common ancestry with. And, and this is one of the reasons, because the life cycle, and I hope you recognize this as a life cycle diagram, uh, the life cycle of fungi is very similar to the life cycle of these cellular slime molds, uh, the acrisiomycetes. And the first thing to note is that um, it's mostly haploid. So in the diagram here, all this uh, bluish color is all haploid. And even this can be considered relatively haploid, um, but this is a special condition where there are actually two nuclei in the same cell, which is known as heterokaryotic. All right, and then this is the only part of the diagram that is diploid. So the only diploid is the zygote, which is basically the, the um, opposite of our own life cycle, where uh, you know we we are also diploid. Uh, as a zygote, but then we, the zygote then starts to multiply, uh, dif divide, and differentiate and give rise to all the specialized cells that make up our body. And, and all the cells of our body are diploid. The only ones that aren't are our sex cells. Well, in fungi, uh, their body cells are mostly haploid. And the only time in the whole life cycle that they are diploid is when the two nuclei fuse together um, which can be considered fertilization to form the zygote. And the zygote is the only diploid, and then it starts to divide. It immediately undergoes meiosis. It, it divides by meiosis, which, as you know, reduces the number of chromosomes in half. And so immediately the zygote, uh, the cells that come from the zygote or, or uh, divide from the zygote are haploid. And they remain that way for most of the life cycle and through the life of the fungus. So the diagram is divided into two halves. We've got asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction. And there are really two forms of asexual reproduction. One is known as fragmentation, where just a piece of the fungus, a piece of hyphae will break off, and that hyphae is able to regenerate uh, and grow and become a whole new fungus. That's known as fragmentation, where a fragment can actually give rise to a whole individual. But there's also uh, asexual reproduction of spores. Um, so these spores are being produced from a haploid individual and they're being produced by meios mitosis. They're being produced by mitosis from sporangia, uh, the spore producing structures. Um, and the sporangia are, uh, at, they form at the tips of specialized hyphae called sporangiophores. So sporangiophores form sporangia, which produce spores. When it comes to sexual reproduction, there are no male and female in fungi. Uh, they're referred to as opposite mating types, plus, and they're designated as plus and minus mating types. So two hyphae of opposite mating types will come together 
and their cytoplasms will fuse, and that's known as plasmogamy. And you can remember it's plasmogamy because for the cytoplasm to fuse, that means the plasma membranes have to fuse. So the plasma membranes fuse between these two, the, the hyphae of these two mating types, and that joins their cytoplasm together. And it also places two nuclei in, in each cell. So that's the condition known as heterokaryotic, two different nuclei in one cell. Hetero means other or different, and karyotic refers to nucleus. So we have two different nuclei, heterokaryotic, different nuclei in the same cell. And, you know, how we symbolize uh, haploid as N and diploid as 2N. Well, in the case of heterokaryotic, it's N plus N. These are two haploid nuclei that have not fused together yet, and they're uh, together, but they are together within one cell. So that's N plus N, heterokaryotic. Eventually then those two nuclei fuse and that's known as karyogamy. And again, karyo, karyo refers to nucleus. So karyogamy is the fusion of the nu nuclei. And that produces the zygote, which again is the only diploid in the life cycle. The zygote then immediately undergoes meiosis and produces spore producing structures and spores by meiosis, um, which are haploid. So fungal spores are always haploid, and, and then they, when they germinate, they give rise to haploid individuals. In other words, all the body cells of a multicellular fungus are haploid, not diploid like ours. So again, that's the generalized life cycle of fungi, uh, but we're going to be looking more specifically at what happens uh, during sexual reproduction, especially in different phyla of fungi. And because that's what's used to differentiate them. That's what's used to classify them. Spores are very, very small. And the, what's great about them as a mode of reproduction uh, is that they disperse far and wide. They're so small that they're practically the size of the particles of smoke. I don't know if you've thought about it before, but smoke is made up of very tiny particles that are very easily carried away by the wind. And spores are about the same size as those particles of smoke, so they are as easily carried away by wind. And that is one mode of uh, dispersal, spore dispersal. So what we're looking at here is known as a puffball. And they can be relatively large, almost the size of a soccer ball. And um, they are full of spores. And it's been um, calculated that if all the spores of, I think it's two puffballs, two large puffballs were to germinate, it would outweigh the earth. And I, I think just one puffball would outweigh the earth and two puffballs would outweigh the earth a number of times. So it's just an unbelievable number of spores and it's a very good thing that they don't all germinate. Um, but if you've ever come, if you ever come across a puffball and you poke it, or, or in the case of a big one, you know, like play soccer with it and give it a kick, uh, what looks like smoke is going to come out of it, but that smoke is actually made up of millions of teeny, teeny tiny little spores. So spores have been a really good way for fungi to disperse all over the planet. And one mode of spore dispersal is wind. Another mode of spo spore dispersal is water. Uh, so there are fungi known as cup fungi. And you can see why they call them cup fungi, because the fruiting bodies form a cup shape. And the reason they form a cup shape is because when the spores form inside the cup, you know, remember the cup is going to be lined with sporangia producing spores. When it rains, water droplets will fall into the cup and splash the spores out of the cup. And, you know, it's not going to disperse as far and wide as wind dispersal, but it's still going to at least get a little bit far away from the parent fungus. And, you know, if it lands in a suitable environment in the soil, it's going to germinate and start to grow into a new individual. Then in the case of this starfish fungus, and you can kind of see why they call it starfish, you'll notice that it's kind of like a starfish from hell, though. I mean, it looks terrible. It looks like it comes, comes. I don't, I don't know, it's, it's like a, a, a Halloween costume or something. It looks evil or hideous. Um, and if you were to smell it, you would also smell that it smells pretty bad. And what it smells like is a rotting corpse or rotting meat. And that's because its spores are dispersed by flies. So this starfish fungus puts out a stink like rotting meat that flies love. The flies come and they land on, on the fungus 
and they even can feed on the fungus. Um, and then they pick up the spores. They, you know, the spores stick to their legs and so forth, and they go flying off, and, and they drop the spores at some point far away from the parent fungus. So it's a very efficient way of, of spore dispersal. And it's also very similar to uh, the way that flowers operate in plants, you know, to, to disperse pollen from one flower to another, um, or also to disperse their seeds because animals will come along and eat the fruit the flower turns into a fruit, an animal will come along and eat the fruit and then go travel a long distance before the seeds are uh, either dropped or, or come out in their poop. But either way, um, the way of spore dispersal here is very similar. It's an example of convergent evolution, where both the kingdom plantae and the kingdom fungi have evolved ways of dispersing their reproductive structures uh, using animals to, to disperse them, to carry them around. So that's our introduction to fungi. Next time we'll be looking at how fungi are classified.